So welcome everybody. Uh, why don't we get started? Keep getting uh, food. Uh, that's one of the things we promise here. But what we also promise is very stimulating and interesting uh, discussion and conversation around some of the important uh, changes that are going on in the legal profession. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm David Wilkins. I'm the faculty director of the Center on the Legal Profession. This is our weekly speaker series uh, in which we bring in leading professionals and some academics, but mostly professionals, to talk about some of the important things happening in the profession. And uh, I'm really thrilled today to introduce Mary Struther. I was just actually speaking to her uh, saying that I actually believe, and it's not just because she's here, that the role that she has is one of the most important in the legal profession today. In fact, uh, I wrote an article, which uh, if you haven't read, I'll make sure I'll send it to you with my friend Elizabeth Chambliss on what we call the development of ethical infrastructure in large law firms. This was back in 2002 when uh, the position of general counsel was really novel. There were very few general counsels inside law firms. I would say now every major law firm has at least one person, and the best ones have more than one person, who really is focusing on this issue. And it's because um, the law firms are much more complex institutions. They face much more risk on a whole range of levels. And that they really, and the rules to which they have to comply to are much more complex. Uh, and one way to think about this is, is it's about liability, but it's really about so much more than that because uh, in another project, which we've reported on here at other occasions, we've done this big survey on how companies purchase legal services when the work is important. And one of the increasing trends is that companies are looking at inside the law firm at their quality control systems and their training systems. Uh, and that, therefore, one way in which the best law firms are responding is to try to demonstrate the value of what they do, in part by demonstrating the internal structures by which they assure quality results. Uh, I know for a fact that no law firm has really taken this more seriously uh, than Wilmer Hale, uh, and one of the people most responsible for that is our guest, and so I'm delighted to introduce Barry Strong. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm, can, can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm getting over a cold, so I apologize, but I, I'm going to use the mic so that I don't have to scream. And if I start coughing in the middle of this, just bear with me. Um, so thank you, Professor Wilkins. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and thank you, Nathan, for organizing everything and talking me through it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I thought I would... Uh, I do, I do feel a little bit out of place here. I know I, I looked at all the speakers you've had in the recent years and all the ones you have lined up, um, and they're from all over the world, and they talk about giant, big uh, global problems and uh, offer solutions for all of uh, the troubles that the legal industry faces um, today. And I have no answer, no big answers. Um, I'm not here. Neither to, do we, actually. <laughs> um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not here to give you any major pearls of wisdom. Um, but I can talk a little bit about, um, I don't know about high level decision making, but I can talk, I, I, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of the everyday decisions um, that, uh, that folks in my role have um, that really just keep the law firm moving forward in a responsible way. Uh, way. And sometimes those small decisions can have major, uh, in, you know, major, major repercussions or the lack of, of a th well thought out decision can have a major negative repercussion. So they are important decisions even though at the time they don't always seem to be uh, earth shattering. Um, so I, I'll give you a little bit of background about how I got into the role of Deputy General Counsel at uh, Wilmer Hale. And, um, and then I thought we could maybe talk through and get you guys talking a little bit um, about, you know, throw out some hypotheticals and we'll talk through how, what you would think about if you were in my role as general counsel. Not really the answer to the, to the legal problem, but more the strategy on how to, how to get to the answer. Okay, so a little bit about myself. I'm, uh, I'm actually originally from Atlanta, Georgia. 
So after this year, I may be returning to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but uh, I went to Princeton University uh, undergrad and then uh, took a year between college and law school and then went to Columbia Law School. But don't hold that against me. Um, uh, and then after clerking for a year out in San Francisco in the district court and a year back in Atlanta on the 11th Circuit, um, I decided to come up and uh, accept a job in the litigation department at Hale and Door. And I've been there for my entire career. Uh, Hale and Door, um, at the time I joined it, was a large Boston based firm. We had probably 400 uh, lawyers with a small office in Washington, D.C. And we've percolated along like that uh, for about 10 years until 2000, uh, well, 10 years from my tenure there until 2004 when suddenly we doubled in size overnight uh, when we merged with Wilma Cutler Pickering, a law firm in DC. And we, for a while we were stumbling around calling ourselves Wilma Cutler Pickering Hail and Door, and that just got really too hard, so we decided we would just say Wilma Hale, and that's who we've been since 2004. And that's really kind of how I got into the position of Deputy General Counsel at the firm. Um, at the time of the merger, as you can imagine, we were merging everything, all sorts of systems. And one of the um, most uh, difficult things to merge are your clients when two large firms are getting together because um, you may soon realize, gee, we're, we're actually on opposite sides of a few of these things, or our clients don't all get along. Um, like what can we, how can we make these conflicts work out? And so that takes a lot of time, and it ha has to be done very carefully. And in addition to having clients who, you know, don't want, you know, don't want to be adverse to your other clients and don't want you representing both of them, you've got a lot of partners who don't understand why you know, their client can't come in uh, and they can't bring in this new client because somebody they've never met in another office has a client who's adverse. Well, that just doesn't make sense. I've always been able to bring in any client I want. And I'm the big cheese and you have to do a lot of ego stroking and negotiating and explaining how we're a bigger family now and we all need to get along and stuff like that. So that was a lot of of, of the work of the general counsel's office in the early years after the merger. Um, so fast forward to today, um, you know, the firm is about a thousand, about 1,100 attorneys. Uh, we're in 14 cities around the world. Um, we have 290 partners and 800 and some odd associates, counsel, staff attorneys, et cetera. So it's a lot of lawyers, um, and not to mention staff and administrators and so forth. Um, and we, um, you know, we, we really needed at that point, if you think about any corporation of that size, um, you're going to have a general counsel's office. Um, some people think, well, gee, why would you need a general? You're all lawyers, so how, why would you need lawyers? Well, lawyers need a lot of legal advice. As a matter of fact, they're often thinking through the leap, the fact that something might be an issue ethically, um, more so than a non-lawyer at a company might be thinking about it. Um, and they're asking a lot of really good questions. And they need someone that they can go to for confidential, privileged communication. Um, and they don't want to be picking up the phone and calling another law firm and asking those questions if they can avoid it. Um, so we have a formal uh, a general counsel's office. That doesn't mean we have a little, like a little broken out section of the building or anything, but we, we do have titles. Um, there are three general counsels at Wilmer Hale. Um, they are all uh, have a full-time uh, client practice as well as doing this work. And that's why we have three of them, because they all wanted to continue to practice. Two of them are in D.C. One is a corporate lawyer, and one is a, a litigation lawyer, and then one is in our Boston office, also a litigator, IP litigation specifically. So because the three of them have an active um, client practice, there are two deputy general counsel, uh, one in DC and myself in Boston. Um, and we are, I, I'm not 
I, I am not full-time Deputy General Counsel, but I am almost full-time at this point. I started out sort of 50-50, still maintaining a client practice, but over time, because once you're, people know you're there, the phone starts ringing more and more, I really have almost exclusively do that. And when I can pick up a small matter, I try to. And I've also tried to do some more uh, work out in the legal community, which I'll touch on briefly. Um, that is uh, kind of complements the work I do at the firm. So, um, uh, so my job really is to deal with uh, the, the other deputy general counsel. Um, really deals with client intake. She ha heads up a very large business um, intake department that clears conflicts, <coughs> and so her job is from before the matter comes into the firm to getting the matter into the firm. And she does that full time and has a very large staff assisting her with that. I deal with whatever happens after the client, after the client has retained us. If something goes wrong, someone's unhappy, we have a question, um, it sort of comes into my uh, area. That's the way I, in my own mind at least, define it. Now there are times when we have a very sticky conflicts issue and we're all five of us are huddled around trying to work it through because they can be very, very complicated and require a tremendous amount of thought, research, discussion. And we'll, one of the hypotheticals will deal with a situation like that that came up in another firm recently that I thought would be interesting to talk about. So that's basically my how I got where I am and, and what I do. Um, so why do you need a general counsel? I touched on it a little bit, but um, you know, law firms do get sued by their clients. It happens. Um, and uh, there needs to be a lawyer in-house who's going to deal with that, who's going to um, help advise and the lawyers who are the subject of the lawsuit, um, defend the firm, report to the insurance, you know, the malpractice insurers, keep them in the loop, um, make big decisions uh, about the litigation, maybe represent the firm, maybe hire outside counsel to represent the firm. There's just a, a litany of things you have to think about um, when the firm gets sued. And it's much better to have someone who's got a little distance from the matter dealing with it than having the lawyer who's name is in the complaint, who's outraged at someone who accused them of doing something that's completely um, unheard of and that's, you know, you need a little distance and you, you need someone who can kind of take, take the complaint and really delve into it and, and try to have a little more perspective. Um, law firms also get served with subpoenas more than often than you would think. Um, Perfect example of when uh, a firm gets, sued, uh, gets served with a third party subpoena is when you might have done a patent prosecution work for a client. Patents issued. Now, years later, that patent is the subject of some litigation. Maybe the firm's not even representing the client anymore, but the, and the, the, uh, the plaintiff uh, or the defendant wants to see the client, the prosecution files. They want to know all the work that was done to prosecute the patent. Were all the you know, pieces of prior art disclosed at the, uh, to the law firm uh, at the time? Or was there art that they, that, that they should have been aware of that they didn't show the patent office? Lots of questions like that. So we get, we get served with a subpoena. We've got to figure out how we're going to, um, to respond to it. You also have you know, law firms enter into contracts, not just engagement letters, which are Contracts that have to be negotiated sometimes with clients, sometimes very heavily negotiated, um, but also vendors and others, and those contracts have to be reviewed, just like an in-house law lawyer would review contracts for a company. Um, and of course, lawyers are held to very high ethical standards and are subject to rules of professional responsibility, which can be um, tough to interpret sometimes when lawyers find themselves in difficult situations. And it's helpful to have a lawyer who's very familiar with the rules and who can help uh, counsel um, their colleagues on, on the ethical rules. And then the last reason really is because um, the way the law is trending uh, in a challenging com the communications that lawyers have with their in-house counsel. 
So the way this law has developed, and there have been a number of states that have, have uh, issued opinions recently on this, um, a client uh, sues its law firm, says that lawyer A made a mistake. Um, and uh, lawyer A, when he, when he gets, when he even first finds out that the client's very upset, client called me, he's really upset, he says, I, I made a big mistake in something, what do I do? Lawyer A goes and talks to the general counsel. The general counsel gives lawyer A some legal advice about how to respond to that, um, that angry client. Now the client is in litigation with the law firm, and the client says, well, I want all the communications you had, I want you to tell me everything you told your in-house counsel when you were getting legal advice about this. And the law firm says, well, that's privileged. And the client says, no, it's not. You don't get a, to have a privilege. Your privilege is with me. Mm -hmm. And I paid you to give me legal advice. And so whatever communications you had back and forth with your in-house lawyer, that belongs to me. That everything belongs to me. This was client work. And the way that law firms have been successful in maintaining the confidentiality and the privilege of the communications between lawyer A and in-house counsel are in circumstances where there is a defined general counsel's office at the law firm. Um, the client is not billed for the communication between lawyer A and in-house counsel. So I get people call me all the time, they're like, oh, you can bill your time to blah, blah. I say, actually, I can't bill my time to that client, or you won't be able to, to um, maintain the confidentiality of this conversation, and I think you would like to do that. <laughs> and of course, the in-house counsel cannot have work, worked on that matter, right? So they can't be stepping in and out of the role. Um, so if it happens that there's a problem on a matter where one of our general counsels has been a billing attorney on the matter, um, he could not be then giving advice to his to the other folks on that team in a capacity as in-house counsel. It just gets too blurred. Um, so when those, you know, when those circumstances exist, the, the, the privilege has been upheld. So that's why we're all, and you'll see most firms now, will have people with the title, designated title general counsel and deputy general counsel. Okay, so that's basically kind of in a nutshell why it's a good idea to have the office. Now, before I go into some hypotheticals and try to get you guys talking a little bit, I thought I'd say, well, high-level decision-making, okay, I'm going to see how many high-level decisions I make in a month. <laughs> so I just took a little running, took a notepad, and as people called or emailed, I made a little running list of the questions I've been asked over the past month or so. I thought I would read them out to you. Okay, so here's what I got. It was actually in the um, like late evening I was taking a call from the high school my, right before my kids chorus concert trying to understand what the issues were because people were about to get on a plane to go talk to a new client. I'm on my way to a client meeting with X Corp which is the parent of Y Corp. I need advice regarding parent subsidiary privilege because I will be speaking with employees and in-house counsel of Y Corp is the discussion privileged? If so, who can I have a privileged discussion with? Um, next question. I want to represent a former employee of my client at the former employee's deposition about his work on the development of my client's new drug. Can I accept the representation? Whom do I bill? Next question. I think the expert witness on the other side of my case, who happens to be a lawyer, has violated the rules of professional conduct. Can I assert the violation and move to strike him from their witness list? Next question. I need to terminate a client representation. How do I do that? What do I do about billing? What do I do with the client's files? Next question. My wife's a reporter and is assigned to cover a case where our firm represents one of the parties. Is that a problem? Next question. Can I draft a pleading for my pro bono client to file in Vermont State Court pro se, even though I'm not a member of the Vermont Bar and my name won't appear on the complaint? Next question. Does my client, that's a company, have a common legal interest with the inventors on a patent application such that my conversations with the inventors are protected by the attorney-client privilege? 
Next question. Could I send out a tweet to encourage my followers to donate to my client's Kickstarter campaign to raise venture capital money? <laughs> Next question. We want to mention our victory in the Apple case on our webpage. What can we say? Do we need disclaimers? Do we need Apple's approval? I probably shouldn't have said Apple in here. Um, next question. Can we solicit potential clients for our pro bono class action by approaching them at town meetings? What can we say? How can we get them to join the class? Next one. A formal, former paralegal just filed an administrative complaint against the firm for alleged discrimination. What do we do? Can we represent ourselves? And last one, which I get all too often. This letter came to the firm, but addressed to no one in particular. What should we do with it? <laughs> so that's like that's a typical month or so random questions that just come my way. And I, most of the time, don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I endeavor to get back to them, figure it out, think about it for a while, maybe discuss it with my fellow general counsel and, and come back to it. But they're all, um, you know, kind of not exactly high level, but you can imagine that giving the wrong answer to some of those could create some big problems. So we have to be very careful um, about the advice we give and make sure that it's got a solid basis so that it doesn't start a very bad rock rolling down a hill. Okay, well, I thought I'd run through some hypotheticals, but oh, first I did want to say one other thing in case it, it comes up later. Um, I had said before that one of the other things I've tried to do is get a little bit involved in the legal community in, in general, rather than just doing my in-house uh, Wilmer Hale stuff. And that's something that I would highly recommend that all of you do as you begin your legal career, whether you're at a firm or in a public interest. Uh, but particularly large firms can be, can be isolating. They're, your training is all, for the most part, available at your firm. And um, there's so many opportunities to do things within the firm and so much pressure to you know, get your work done and take on more work and so forth that a lot of associates um, don't take the time to sort of reach out into the legal community. And I was the same way um, until I got a little more senior and then I realized it's very helpful to get to know folks, especially when you start to specialize in a particular area, to get to know the other folks in your community who are doing some of the same work. So I started by joining the Ethics Committee of the Boston Bar Association, um, which ha I've been doing for a number of years now, and it's been very rewarding. There's professors, there, government lawyers, and there's private practicing attorneys all um, on that committee, and it's a great way to sort of get to know what's going on, what are the hot topics, what am I you know, not worrying about that I should be. I'm obviously a member of a couple of general counsel roundtable groups, both locally and nationally, where we sit around it every quarter or so and really get each other worried about uh, <laughs> problems because, like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Are we doing that? Should we be doing that? Um, so um, those are more like therapy sessions than anything else. <laughs> And then I recently had the opportunity to become a member of the um, board of Massachusetts Board of Bar Overseers, which has been really interesting. Uh, it's the disciplinary body in Massachusetts that um, handles all lawyer admonitions and suspensions and disbarments and reinstatements. Um, so that's been really, uh, really a really professionally rewarding experience. I've gotten to know a lot of great lawyers and, well, I've gotten to see a lot of not so great lawyers, but on the, on the board, on the board itself, I've gotten to know a lot of really terrific lawyers, and um, and that, that has been a very something that's been very fulfilling for me, and it's also something that the firm has really appreciated that I've done because um, it I think it has sort of expanded my ability to advise folks at the firm to make sure they never end up in in front of that board. Yes. So, do you mind taking a question? No, no, I'm sorry. I should have said anybody who wants to fire questions, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you. I'm Heidi Gardner. I'm a fellow here. At the okay, Center great. Profession. Um, it was a fascinating list of issues that you addressed uh, you know, on, on the fly, reactively, to what was coming in from your attorneys. 
I'm curious what role, if any, you play prospectively in, in setting policy or direction or strategy or something else for the firm. Yeah, sure. Well, that I, pro I should have touched on that. So we uh, definitely worry about prospective things as well. And so w some of my work is training. Um, every incoming associate uh, gets, uh, we, we do an, go through an ethics training. It's actually three sets of training. There's an introductory <coughs> training where we go through the firm's policies and orient them to um, our, our ethics policies and other important policies. We then have a one hour session called the ethical lawyer where we talk about duties of confidentiality, maintaining the client's files, privilege issues and the like. And then we have a whole separate privilege training uh, session that's a couple hours long. And every incoming associate in the first year they're there must go through that training. There's then a sort of supplemental ethics training for uh, as, you as you are promoted to counsel and then again put to partner. There's another ethics training program that, uh, that's sort of tailored to those positions. Um, we also have an ethics committee, and I'm a member of that, and that, that committee sets the policy for the firm on ethics um, and when things need to be changed or um, you know, altered, we, we help uh, recommend, make recommendations to management on that. For example, we're working on our Twitter policy right now, the question about can I tweet, blah, blah. Uh, you know, we ha there, that is a form of marketing now, and it's subject to, you know, the que you know, the questions of whether it's subject to the rules of professional responsibility and attorney advertising are still up in the air. So we're working on sort of trying to guide lawyers on how they can use Twitter in a responsible way without running afoul of the rules. Mary, I, I always found it odd who the client was with a GC. So in a scenario where we have a partner who has behaved poorly, and we're told that there is an ongoing investigation, which may result in a litigation or case before a court, and then we're told we're, we can't talk about it after that, and we can't inquire uh, about what the allegations are or what the firm's involvement is. So as a partner, I have exposure to what my other partner did, but I'm being told by general counsel I can't know what they did. Who's, who's the client? Well, the client's the firm. And what is and the, the Well, you know, I mean, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, No, I, that, in our firm, we, we don't think it's appropriate to spill the nitty-gritty details, but we um, Keep the f keep the partnership informed of of the major um, major pieces of exposure, for example, but not in any detail. And the man now the management committee they would know they would know. Yeah. So is there a privilege just within the management committee or? I, I, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I haven't looked into whether you would say, well, that I only have a privilege with the management. I mean, I, any lawyer who comes to me, you can, well, it depends. If the lawyer comes to me and says, look, I need to talk to you about something that you can't tell anybody, I have to say to them, look, I'm the lawyer for the firm. I can't, I can't give you personal legal advice, and if you tell me something that is, you know, impacts the firm's liability, I have, an, uh, I have a duty to tell management. So if you think you're going to tell me something secret, you better, you know, do you, I can't promise you I'm going to keep it confidential. Right. That's the best I can answer uh, that it's question. It's a great answer. I mean, I, I just, <coughs> for the students, I mean, I think it's a fascinating example of model rule one point whatever it is, 13, that says you represent the entity. But here's a situation where the entity is actually made up of the partners, but okay. then you could say in a corporation, the entity is made up of the shareholders, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have a duty to tell all the shareholders. So I think this is just one example of where the as law firms get bigger and bigger, they take on more of the uh, of the look and feel of what a company looks like with That's respect exactly to a role right. like this. That's exactly right. So it'd be more like those disclosures you see in the uh, K ones mm -hmm. to the general partnership rather than the real nitty gritty of what's going on. <laughs>
And it's, it's the only fair, because if you're the lawyer who's getting dragged through the process, you don't want the dirty laundry that's probably ultimately going to end up being fine, and you're not, you're not, you know, not going to be found to have any liability. But you don't want all your partners to know what you're going through. It's just not right. So we don't discuss it broadly. Well, if it's okay, I thought I'd throw out a couple of hypotheticals, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see how we do. <laughs> okay, so we'll talk first. We'll talk about the mistake, a potential mistake. <laughs> so Dan, who's a partner in your law firm, calls you up, and he just got on his desk a notice from the Japanese Patent Office, and it says that this patent that he's been prosecuting all over the world. He's got the U.S. patent, maybe he's already issued, or the applications filed at least, and he's been processing these divisional applications all over. Well, I just got this letter back from the Japanese Patent Office saying that the patent lapsed in Japan because a fee wasn't paid. So now the patent is not enforceable in Japan anymore. So he calls you, he comes to you and says, well, what do I do now? Now, I'm not asking you whether he's committed malpractice, okay? I'm not asking you, you know, how he goes about um, reviving the patent through some mechanism that you, if you, you probably wouldn't know even if you had taken patent law. I'm asking you, if you're me, what do you do? Do you be like, gee, I'll call you back in 10 minutes, or, uh, you know, do you... You talk to your partner and start asking him questions. Anybody want to hazard a guess? There's no wrong answer other than, you know, tell him, you know, to, that, uh, to pretend like the letter never came, shred it, and walk <laughs> away. That would, be, that would be the bad advice. I think you have to ask your, your partner what has been the protocol in the past to maintain such fees to determine what the exposure of the firm is. If, if in fact, our paralegal department were supposed to file these fees, you yeah. need to know the best defense for your offense. And I think once you find that out, I guess the other rule is do no harm. I think you have to, once you've gathered the facts, timely inform the client of the exposure. Because every day that goes by, the exposure grows greater. Exactly, yeah. So that's the, those are the two big things that you first ask. You know, how, you know, First question I usually ask is, can this be repaired? Because sometimes it's a matter of, well, just pay them more money and they'll find it and suddenly they'll revive the patent. Sometimes it's like, no, I'm sorry. You miss it, you're done. So if the answer is the former, you say, well, get, get the process moving to repair the damage and tell your client and tell them how you're going to solve the problem. The, it, promptly informing the client is crucial. Um, and uh, the reason is because when the client, when it gets hidden from the client, it just, it, it just makes everything worse. Because then in addition to the malpractice claim, they have the claim that you intentionally withheld the information from them for some period of time. Um, and it, it just gets, goes from bad to worse. So. When do you have to notify the malpractice insurance carrier? So, well, there's di different people have different levels of tolerance of, uh, yeah. of, of can, we, can we wait t 30 days and see if this gets repaired mm -hmm. versus we got to tell them right away. And it, it's, it's a little bit of a judgment call um, on, on some of these. Usually, I mean, our philosophy is there's no harm in telling your insurer something right away because you can always call them the following week and say, great news, you can close that claim or that circumstance, it's done. But one of my jobs when I get a call like this is to make that decision. Do we need to notify our carrier? And um, there are, it's a pretty low threshold for us on notifying the carrier. There's really no downside to it. Um, and there's a terrible downside to not notifying them because if you look at your policy, there'll be a period of time where if you knew it for more than a certain number of days and didn't report it, you're in trouble. Um, the other thing that I uh, will think about and is do we need to preserve documents? Mm -hmm. Just like a company that's threatened with suit or knows that they have some liability, gee, well, 
maybe we should make sure just to be sure nobody accidentally deletes their emails or when a f person who worked on this matter leaves the firm, ordinarily we will delete their emails after a certain period of time. Um, or that, you know, their inbox emails, if they've, if they've filed things away, that would be okay, but yes? Yeah, I was also curious, um, when do you tell the lawyer that they should look into getting their own counsel? Like, I mean, something like this seems pretty routine, like it right. seems like you could defend them, but what, what's that? Line well, or I mean, clearly when you get into an adversarial relationship, but even you might think the lawyer wants to, yeah. to lawyer up. Well, they, <laughs> they, 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 there have been lawyers who've asked that, but basically, if 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 they did something, even if it, they made a huge mistake, yeah. as long as they did it in you know in the context of practicing law at our firm, they are going to be covered. Yeah. The thing that they would want their own lawyer for is if they were stealing money from the firm, let's say, or something like that, right? Doing something that was really, uh, you know, outside the scope of their employment, so to speak. But this kind of thing would always be covered, and we would say to them, don't worry, we're in this together. I mean, I say that over and over. But this is also a disciplinary complaint in the, yeah. the bar. Um, for a disciplinary because, complaint? I mean, obviously, monetary, yeah. you can... Become yeah. whole, but it, it no, we would, we, we would, we would, that that would typically be covered by our insurance as well. Yeah. But, I mean, how is it covered? May I just not understand? But how is it covered? Because if you have a disciplinary action that's against you, right? It's a mark on you. Yes, that's as an true. Attorney, that you can never be made whole. Right. On, even no, right. No, it, uh, when I think about insurance, I mean, like, uh, there, we we might prob we might have a another. An outside counsel to represent them, not, but it would still be covered by the firm's policy. So yeah, no, there's no, there wouldn't be any monetary. It would only be the cost of having counsel to represent you through the disciplinary process. Um, but but yeah, no, it's a, that's another situation when when thankfully those things are rare. But when they do happen, it's look, we are with you. We are. We're your lawyers, and we're here, to, we're here to support you. We're not going to turn you to the wolves just because you've got someone accusing you of doing something really awful. You may after you settle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have a yeah, and sometimes you have to say, "Look," Goodbye. and then you know, here's I mean, but uh, it might be different with third parties, right? I mean, so for example, if it's a securities issue, or a, that is, it's not it's not necessarily between the lawyer and the client, but it's between the lawyer and a third party. And the, I mean, I guess the question I think what Nick is trying to explore is, if you were in a company setting, mm -hmm. there's a much lower threshold, or, or let's put it this way, a much higher threshold for you to represent both the entity and the employee right. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And maybe it goes back to Derek's point, too, that here there's this very complicated thing where at least for partners, that entity and the, the line between entity and employee is closer together. But I wonder if that's something you think about, particularly when it's a third party who's <coughs> bringing an allegation and you might be able to make the argument that the person was acting outside of the scope of yeah. their... Argument. Well, I think you, you, could, you could make that argument. Certainly in that, that I suppose you, if, you, if you think about the situations where there have been lawyers who've been investigated by the SEC, yeah. right? That's absolutely a situation where you'd say, hey, you, you're going to need your own lawyer. Because yeah. the firm is going to represent themselves. Right. And, and, and where our interests have now diverged. Yeah. Yeah. But when it's... That's not in the... You would say, well, uh, you know... Uh, that that type of thing would probably not be something they're doing in the scope of their employment, so yeah. it's got, not going to be we're not going to be aligned. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. <coughs> um, okay, so then you know the other thing when you get a situation like this where you have you know, perhaps that the ball got dropped somewhere along the process from the docketing clerks or the paralegals or the attorneys, whoever, because these things are fairly um, you know, there's a fairly set dates and oh, you've got to do this by this date and this by this date and it's a lot to keep track of but you want to make sure you have the systems in place so that these things don't happen and when they do um, you know the other question that I ask is tell me the system 
tell me how the system broke down in this case, and tell me how we're going to make sure it doesn't break down the next time. Was it a person? Was it a personnel issue? Was it a was it a systems issue? What happened? And we we got to make sure it doesn't happen again. So those are the types of things that, that I think about in this in this situation. But we'll try another one. Wanna, whoop. Subpoena. Oh. <laughs> Calling from bad to worse. <laughs> <laughs> so the subpoena. Well, actually, I think it, it's probably uh, worse uh, to, to uh, bad. Okay. Subpoenas aren't so bad. Okay. <laughs> Although the person who gets served with the subpoena is usually pretty panicked about it. <laughs> so a situation is, you know, reception calls and asks whether they should. They, there's a there's a constable at the receptionist desk. Subpoena it says Wilmer Hale in the front, big letters. They want to know what they're supposed to do with it. It's, it's, a, it's addressed to the attention of your partner, Lester, and uh, he's a corporate lawyer. And um, you go up and you take a look at the subpoena and you say, OK, well, yeah, this is not Lester's divorce or anything. This has to do with work he did at the firm. And I'll accept service of the subpoena. So you take the subpoena down to your office. You read through it. You see that there's litigation between Lester's, uh, Lester's client, Wayland Foods, and it's one of its former, uh, one of its founders, and um, you know they want all the firm's documents that have to do with the corporate work Lester did when he um, helped form the company, for example, and they want to take Lester's deposition, just for good measure. So you call Lester and you congratulate him on having received the subpoena, and typically <laughs> Lester says, "Oh, okay, that's terrible, but." I know you'll just make it go away, so call me when this is over. <laughs> and you say, well, gee, Lester, I wish it was that easy. But let me explain to you what a subpoena means. You can't blow it off. So then you go about the process of preserving documents and so forth. But I actually kind of just told you what I would say. Yeah. <laughs> but if you guys have any other thoughts, I mean, on how you you're, you're also our psychologist, having been there. Yeah. You're nervous because you get this subpoena, right? Right. And you don't know really what the, the, the core of the complaint is. So I often found our general counsel was helpful in trying to talk us off the ledge that don't worry. Exactly. Us, but you need to go through all of your files because then you become a client. Exactly. Right. As a partner, you right. have to sort of relinquish your role as counsel. Right. And become a client, which is very hard to do. Exactly. And you have to, and, and, and I, as the Deputy General Counsel, have to sit down with you and talk to you about how important it is that you, you can't just tell me the files are in your second drawer and go get them. <laughs> You've got to go through them. Right. You've got to help me determine what's responsive and what isn't. Because I didn't go through the, I didn't do the work. Yes? How much is it your job and how much is it Vester's job to figure out what's covered by privilege? Well, it's, it's something you work on together. I mean, typically what I do is try to, I'll, and I have a staff attorney who helps me with this, I do the first cut. And I say, look, this is what I think is privilege. And I also, also often try to engage, so if, the, if our client, Wayland Foods, is represented by another law firm in the litigation, I'll work with that law firm because they're going to know what the, where they've made the privilege calls in other, in, when they're producing the client's documents, which also often may be a duplicate of a lot of the stuff we have. So I'll work with them on that. And I'll also work with them on the preparation on Lester's depot prep. Um, so it's in that that creates privilege questions as well. I know, I'm just curious how two parts. So one is who then pays for all of this, right? Kind of internally, like how how does the firm divvy that up? And then two, in people in your role how, how is your role judged in the sense of, you know, partners are bringing in clients and, you know, they're, if they're rainmakers, they're bringing in more. Are the money you save. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. And how many hours you bill. But I assume yeah. in your position, the idea is to bill as few hours as possible, or have as few hours as possible, kind of get through these as efficiently and as quickly as possible. Yeah. How is that That's, tracked internally yeah. or, or am I right about that even? As a, well, it's, I mean, it is true that I might, I, have, I record my time just, I wish I didn't have to, but I record my time just like every other person. And the, the firm sort of views my work as billable. In other words, they're not going to go to the end of the year and say, 
you only worked a hundred hours. Why are we even keeping you? They look and they say, oh, you, were, you worked a lot of hours. Now, we can't collect a dime on any of those, um, but we see that you did the work, that you were here a lot and you were working and doing things that seem important because we're not going down the tubes, right? So that's good. But, um, uh, but you know, it, I'm, I'm not management, so I can't tell you exactly how they quantify it at all. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, they, they, they view my work as billable in terms of sort of getting credit for it. And most firms are self-insured now, so she's extremely valuable. Well, but that's a question. Are you part of a LAS, or are you... Uh, we're, we're, we're not a LAS, but we not, we're not self-insured. Sure. Some of the big okay. firms are really, your role is critical. Well, we well, we say we you know because now we don't have to go out and hire outside counsel for every single problem. Right. I think in the long run it does save the firm some money. Um, does it matter what happens when Lester's not at the firm when you get this? So that's that's happens you know well, obviously these we, days a lot. Right? We probably yes. <laughs> Maybe you're happy he's not there, but still. <laughs> no, then it's a little bit of a wild west because we will still have Lester's documents. Yeah, right. We may still have all Lester's email, mm -hmm. so we still have a lot of slogging through, but we don't necessarily have access to Lester, or Lester's right. not particularly interested in spending a whole lot of time. Even if he wasn't interested when he was at when he was there, but now he's really not interested. Yeah. But um, no, we, you 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 you, should, you obviously communicate with him and let him know what's going on and then if he gets deposed you may or may not come to the deposition and defend him his new firm might want to do that yeah. it's a it's kind of depends yeah. I know the company may want to defend him sometimes they do that other questions about the type of work? maybe time for one more I yeah, think. Please, these are fast. Okay. <laughs> This is a good one. I thought I'd try to keep it current. <laughs> so, um, so Kim, Kim is a transactional lawyer. She's a tax lawyer. And um, she's got a favorite venture capital client. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll call him Willie, <laughs> since I hear Willie's about to start a business. And he's got a great idea, next business venture. He's over. Uh, opening a chain of drive-through medical marijuana stores in Arizona, where it's legal. Um, so he needs Kim, his go-to tax lawyer, who is in Massachusetts, um, to advise him on what the federal tax implications are of this medical marijuana store. She calls you and says, gee, I, is it okay if I do this work? I, mean, I don't know, marijuana it seems kind of close to the edge. What do you think? How do you answer? This was an exam question of mine. A of years oh, ago. really? <laughs> I promise I didn't. Yeah, no, 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 this was a very close to an accurate. Very close to. Not sure. I don't think I'm trying to rape. Uh, well, setting aside the legal question, I think as general counsel, the first question you have to ask is: Kim qualified to rep represent the client? Because the one thing you worry about in any firm is lawyers practicing in an area that they don't have the proper expertise. Right. Because then the brand and the firm's exposure is huge. Um, and then, then you can start to chip away at the legal issues and right. giving her the right team to handle the transaction. Well, but there's a big question whether it's legal in Arizona, but it's still, is it still an illegal controlled substance under the FDA in your yes. example? Right, so that's what makes this, it's legal in Arizona, but the federal government hasn't it's still an illegal controlled substance. Right. So now you get the question of whether she could give, is she an accessory? And the federal government has just said, we're not, the, Eric Holder said, we're sort of not prosecuting. Right. But we're not saying But we're not legal. actually saying right. it's yeah. legal either. Exactly. And so can you, would it actually be, I don't know, an accessory to right. a crime of some kind? And, and exactly right. That's the big question. So the first question is, what well, can Kim do this? And mm -hmm. the first, the first thing I said to Kim is, are you going to be asked to deal with Arizona law? Because 
I know you don't know anything about Arizona. <laughs> she says, no, it's federal tax. It's the, the guy's got businesses all over. I advise him all the time on these particular issues. It's not, I'm not going to have to get into the weeds of state law. Well, no pun intended, state law. <laughs> but, but then you say, well, this has got this federal law, and you have a Massachusetts, so Kim is under the Massachusetts Rules of Professional Responsibility. Arizona, they've amended their Rules of Professional Responsibility. They add a comment that says, you know what, yeah, we, the, let me just tell you, the rule at issue is the Rule 1.2 that says a lawyer shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client in conduct that the lawyer knows is criminal, right? They can talk about the legal consequences of something that's criminal, but they can't assist them in something that's illegal. So is providing federal tax advice to someone who's running a business that's not against the federal law running a foul of 1.2? If you were an Arizona lawyer, you would have an out because the bar, bar there has given you this sort of carve out. In Massachusetts, no such carve out. So you got to figure out, can she do it? That's, that's a great question. Yeah, we have time. No, 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 we have time. No, I just was also curious how much you worry about like reputational concerns yeah. when taking on certain kinds of cases. So there's a question of it legally, but let's say you determine it yeah. is legal for her to give this kind of advice. Uh, do do lawyers ever come and say, you know, should I be representing Kanafi or you know, yeah. whatever yes. <laughs> you know, whatever. That's yeah, that well that is that is something that the firm takes into consideration in certain circumstances. It's not really a general counsel question, it's okay. more a business intake That's management true. type question. Yes. Yeah. But so we're not, we'd be brought more in if there was a, con, a, con, a conflict or a potential conflict or, you know, client won't waive, won't give you an advanced waiver and you want to take this client in for one little case, but if they won't agree that they're going to give you an advanced waiver so that you can be adverse to them in other matters, like they could spoil a whole another area where you're trying to court some really big client. Like those are the kinds of things that as the business comes in, you have to consider that may involve a general counsel decision. Do, do you ever get involved in positional conflicts issues? I mean, we, yes. You know, so for example, in this case, you could imagine you've got clients that are opposed to the legalization of right. medical marijuana or in favor of the, you mm -hmm. know. So, and how do you think about those, which are obviously not quite the straight, you know, right. Adversity of 1.7, but are really now much more about are we going to honor the fact that our clients don't like right. this kind of work? A lot, yeah, a lot of that is done at the business intake so point, you're, you're so it's not really of my. The other side. But, but you know, it comes up a, a, a lot, particularly in the appellate work we do, when, especially when it's a Supreme Court case, it's going to be high profile, and you, you know, and you're you're taking a, a potentially controversial position that your clients may or may not like. It's also an is issue in negotiating general counsel guidelines. Uh, the, nowadays, when a, a large client comes in, they, you, you used to present your client with an engagement letter that set out your terms of engagement. You know, I'm going to charge you this amount, and it's going to be charged by the hour, and, here, and here's what work we're going to do for you, and here's how we're going to handle conflicts, and so forth. We have a, you know, obviously have a, a set engagement letter. And then the client comes back and says, okay, well, here's that's fine. I'll sign your engagement letter. But by the way, here are my guidelines. And they trump anything that's inconsistent in your little pesky letter. And you have to read through those. Thankfully, it's not my job. But read through those and say, and sometimes the, they, will, they will have in there something about a positional conflicts or you can't represent anybody else who's in this particular industry or here are our biggest enemies. None of those can be your clients. And those are difficult things that have to be worked through and, and, and sometimes heavily negotiated. Other questions? I don't think I have time for my last hypothetical, which was... You could just show it. Show it. <laughs> well, that, it, it is a conflict issue. So this one is actually it's a case that you can read in the... Uh, thankfully not our firm, but recently opinion came down um, uh, where 
where there was work done by a law firm in the early 2000s to settle a dispute between Marriott and host hotels. And um, the work ended, the client was now considered a former client, and the rule says that you, you, you can be adverse to a former client as long as the work you're doing for the current client isn't substantially related to the work you did for your former client. The idea being, you don't want to be in a situation where you have you, you could have access to confidential information from the old client that would give you an advantage now when you're adverse to that client, right? That's kind of the philosophy of it. So the general counsel of the former client host gets served with a complaint and notices that it's signed by her former lawyers. And she's pretty, not the actual lawyers, but her former law firm. So she's pretty ticked off. She calls the lawyer that she worked with back in the early 2000s, Roseanne, and says, hey, you guys got a conflict. You can't do this. You know, the, the, this lawsuit's about the work, you know, basically challenging the validity of the settlement you helped me negotiate. Of course, Roseanne has no idea what she's talking about. She didn't know we filed a lawsuit. She didn't know who this other client is. She's a corporate lawyer. These are litigators, probably in a different office. So it falls to the general counsel's office to sort it all out. And go, it is a tedious process. And if you want to read about how tedious it is, you can read the opinion that goes through what the deputy general counsel did in reviewing law, emails and documents and not seeing what the court has determined was a clear conflict until you know, certain paper kind of came to light and it became clear that they had to withdraw. Um, but it's a scathing, unfortunately, it's a scathing opinion, and it's, you know, I read it sort of trembling because I say, gee, you know, that's what I do all the time, and you like to think you're getting it right, but you never know. But it, going back to one, when I can think of one example, he asked, uh, when Abramoff, when Greenberg got the tip, we had to disclose to the authorities first that a crime had been committed. He, again, it's due to no harm because he was clearly adverse to us. He wasn't acting in the interest of the firm and within the scope of his responsibilities. So we sort of immediately put up a wall and served him up. Yeah. Um, well, that, that, that's... So I just think this is, you know, Mary, I, I hope for people who didn't know much about this role before, you can see how unbelievably varied and interesting and complex and scary it is because any question could be asked of you at any time and you've got to really try to figure out how you're going to sort through yeah. this in increasingly complex high stakes situation. So thank you very much for sharing it and we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.